The psalmist in Psalm 100 bids us to enter into the courts of God with thanksgiving and into his gates with praise. For the psalmist knew, and we know, that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the sustainer of every thing, and also the savior of his church. We are among the number, God's special people by the grace of God. We bow and we worship and receive now God's blessing. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father, from Jesus Christ the Lord, through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue our worship in song number 280 in our Psalter hymnal. A versification of Psalm 134, O oh, bless our God with one accord. Remember we spoke of the uh, communion of the saints. This is what we're all about, blessing our God with one accord. Ye faithful servants of the Lord who in his house do stand by night and praise him there with all your might. Three stanzas, 280. It's our privilege at this time to confess the articles of our Christian faith, the church of all ages, and the church of every nation, tribe, and tongue. Remind you that we do, when we confess our faith, we do this in the presence of God as well as in the presence of one another. Let us with reverence and joy and the boldness of faith recite those articles that we love, those summaries of the Holy Word of God. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Continue our worship in song <clears throat> number 296. 296, a... Praise to Jehovah God, who is holy, the rock of my might, and so on. Let's sing stanzas 296, 1, 2, 3, and 5, 296.
Let's pray together, shall we? Our gracious God in heaven, and we thank you with all our heart that you are the holy God, thrice holy, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the awesome God of eternity, the infinite God of infinite and glorious virtues, who has condescended to take regard to the sons of men, even in their sinful state, and to show forth your love. And you have, in answer to the prayer of the mediator, your son you have sent, the son of your love, answered his prayers and taken us into your own fellowship and made us to be covenantally with one, uh, one with you so that we can delight even in your own fellowship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a great and marvelous unity we have been given, Lord, so that we have peace with you and peace with one another and prosperity in the peace of the land, the great shalom of salvation. For those forgiven truly are bent on one thing, even the glory of the God who forgives. And that's who we are, Lord, those forgiven. And those forgiven that we may fear you. And here we do, Father, in the worship of the saints. We fear your name. We enter into your gates with thanksgiving, into your courts with praise. We come with fear and trembling, longing to honor you, to reverence you, to adore you, and to have nothing in the way, no one in the way of our worship and our calling upon your name. Bless us, Lord, so that we can truly know your presence. Bless us that our worship may be in spirit and in truth. Bless us that in this close of the official and public part of the Sabbath day as we gather together as church, that we may have a rest the rest in Jesus, the rest in his completed work on Calvary and his ongoing work from heaven to apply his merits to our account and so that we ourselves can go forth into the week of work knowing that you are with us. Father, help every one of us in this, for we live in a restless age. And as we consider tonight the Antichrist, his spirit is flying about, and speaking so persuasively in false prophets and in the false prophet of the Antichrist to persuade us that there is no rest in God, but only in man. Lord, help us, having heard you today, what you would say to the churches. Have wisdom, have faith, have courage, and have, Lord, the spiritual power and ability not to worship the beast, but to worship you in the name of the Lamb. Father, this is our single year, singular prayer, the prayer of all of our prayers, that we may worship you revealed in the Lamb. Because we love you, Father, and your love is shed abroad in our hearts, and you have told us that we should honor your Son, whom to honor is to honor the Father, and to show that we have the life of the life-giving Spirit of the Son. And so, Father, that prayer is ours. Our prayer, first of all, that you would be hallowed by us sinful ones who nevertheless are your saints, your people in the earth. Be glorified. May your name be exalted in our confiding in you, in our worshipful life and play and work and school, whether we're young or old, whether we are those new to the faith or very mature, God be near to us. May we be those who, having the foretaste of heaven, engage in heaven's own worship, in the foretaste of glory, world without end. We shall be with the company of just men made perfect and of angels, all shouting hallelujahs to God and singing the new song of Moses and of the Lamb. And so we pray that our worship may be speak of heavenly things, lift us to heaven, encourage us and empower us to seek the things above where Christ dwells at your right hand, and also to pray with fervency that Christ himself may come and that his kingdom may come and that quickly. Lord, we're tired. We're full of sin. 
were full of unbelief, were full of the dead men's bones of the old man in Adam. We pray, Father, wilt thou renew us in strength and give us, Lord, to be tireless in our religious exercises so that we can confide in you and be assured that you do give us strength for the journey. Help us even to ride upon the high places, to know the exaltation of those who are exalted even now and made to sit in heavenly places in Jesus. And so in the world and not of it, we shall be a witness of another place and of another God than this world can offer and of the Savior who alone saves sinners and who alone is the name given among men whereby we must be saved. God, we pray that this church may know you, may truly know you and be known as a church that knows you. And we pray then that we may be what we're called to be, the church of Christ, the house of God, the pillar and the ground of truth in this place, among all the people of God who call upon your name in sincerity and in truth. Bless us, Lord, that we can know that your kingdom is coming in all the world, even though the Antichrist is rearing his ugly head, and the deadly wound is healed, and so that the nations are coming together, and there are political forces and religious forces uniting and amassing themselves, in the great propaganda from hell itself to persuade, if, if it were possible, the very elect of God of the lie and to worship the beast. Lord, in these days we are living, perilous times of which the apostles spoke, they're upon us. We pray that we truly may have the sense that there is security only in God our refuge. We may not, Lord, build walls of our own making, even ecclesiastically, but we may be, find our shelter in your own arms and behind your own truth. Hear us, Lord, in this. Preserve us. Call your kingdom out of darkness even in this very dark time. Give, Father, the amazing grace of Jesus to infiltrate every corner of the globe. Even, Lord, in the times of calamity, of storm and typhoon, earthquake and tsunami, and disease and pestilence, we pray <coughs> you would show yourself to be the God in whom alone men must confide if we would have help for body and for soul now and forever. And God, we pray in this day of independence, of men seeking to be their own selves, help us to glory in the fact that we are not our own. We belong to Jesus, the faithful Savior. We pray in our hardships that you would bless us in this as we go to surgeries, as our son and brother David admit, uh, submits to surgery tomorrow, that you would bless him, that you would keep him, and know that he and his eyes and all of his body and all of his soul have been purchased by Jesus' blood, and that all shall be well, and that you are pleased to use physicians to heal body and soul of your own. We pray, Father, for all of those who have one difficulty or another, economic or health or age infirmity. We pray that you would bless also if there's troubles in marriages and homes, past troubles, present troubles, and the anticipation that borders on anxiety of what the future holds. God, we pray, may all your people here at Sovereign Grace Church as well and those who may be listening, may we find our refuge in you and in that way to know that you are the God who's glorified in the help that you give in all these times and for eternity. Lord, hear our prayers. We want, Father, to be in the Spirit, and so give us your Spirit. Your servant, Lord, is desirous of bringing a message from heaven and centered on the cross of Calvary, and on the resurrection and the coming again of your Son. So give him the unction that he needs and the ability to think clearly and recall what he studied and meditated upon and to bring it to our hearts, to bring it to this church and to all who may be hearing. And Lord God in heaven, cause us truly to be lifted up and directed in our souls and bodies in the way everlasting. 
For Jesus' sake, amen. Your offering at this time for the general fund of the church will be received. Two hundred sixty six in the Psalter hymnal. Now Israel may say, and that in truth, that, that the Lord had not our right maintained, that the Lord had not with us remained when cruel men against us rose to strive, we surely have been swallowed up alive. We speak tonight soberly and urgently in seeking wisdom from heaven in the light of the Antichrist, who is Satan's dark uh, minister of, of woe to the church. We need to know what Israel would say, that we find our help in Jesus alone, in God with us in him. And so 266, the three stanzas.
Let's take our Bibles at this time and turn to the book of Revelation in chapter 13, the last part of Revelation 13. We considered last Sunday evening the first beast who rose out of the sea, and here now the revelation that was given to John and is given to us of another beast coming up out of the earth. Revelation 13, verse 11 to the end of the chapter. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that even he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Thus far we read, this is my text, Revelation 13, 11 through 18. May the Lord bless our reading and now also the preaching from Revelation 13 in the light of the whole word of God. We have said and we continue to affirm that Revelation 13 is a revelation of the Antichrist. Antichrist, as we have begun to expound, is the human agent of the devil who opposes Jesus Christ and his people and kingdom and seeks to establish in Satan's employ the kingdom of man. The spirit of Antichrist has been at work among us, especially since Jesus came, according to John's own perception of things, as he was inspired to see in his first epistle in chapter 4. The spirit of Antichrist, John said then in the first century, was already at work in the world, and therefore the spirit of Antichrist opposing God, opposing God's kingdom, opposing God's Christ and his church was already then and is now in the world today. In Revelation 13, as we have been seeing and as we shall hear again tonight, speaks of this Antichrist, especially at the end of the age, as he is the embodiment and culmination in human form of the kingdom of man. He is the embodiment and culmination of all the power of all the deviltry, of all the deceit, of all the blasphemy that ever was before. And the Antichrist, whether he be viewed as the beast rising out of the sea or out of the earth, as is our text, wields such power and political and religious spiritual influence that all the world wonders after the first beast, worships him, and works for him bears his name and mark to show its glad and hearty allegiance. This is the picture of the Antichrist. This is the revelation of God himself that is given not only as some instruction theoretically, but is given as instruction for the church of Jesus Christ. In this point in Revelation 13, John is given even to remind us that we are the ones who are to receive this revelation and not only himself. He brings up words that he used 
when he was speaking in chapters 2 and 3 of his prophecy in the book of Revelation to the churches of Asia Minor, representing all the churches there ever was and shall be in this dispensation. The seven churches of Asia Minor were told, every one of them, to have ears to hear. And so, in Revelation 13, John is moved by the Spirit so that the people who would receive this revelation remember it's something to them. And we are told in Revelation 13, therefore, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. And we are reminded that he who lives by the sword dies by the sword and that vengeance is God's. And also in our text, we are told to have wisdom to discern the number of the beast and to keep ourselves unspotted from the world and those who wonder after the beast, who worship in the beast's name and who work for him with hearty allegiance. So this Antichrist revelation is for us, Church of Jesus Christ. It's for us its sovereign grace and for all who may be hearing. And this beast that we consider tonight, this Antichrist, is this beast who rises with deviltry and subtlety and deceit out of the earth, having two horns like a lamb and who speaks as a dragon. So we want to consider the Antichrist as he is this beast who rises out of the earth. Just two points this evening. First of all, the beast's identity. And secondly, that this is for wisdom and faith in these latter days. Something we need to remember for practical appreciation and preparation for the Antichrist and for our keeping ourselves and our children unspotted from him. And so we have this beast whom we're so told in our text, John sees and we see here, it's written for us, coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon. The first thing I want to say is that this beast is closely related to the first beast of Revelation 13 and the first verses there. There are differences that we'll see, but also similarities, in fact, leading us to see that this, first, this second beast is not altogether different, nor does he represent a different kingdom or power than the first beast. Rather, rather, he's a complement of the first beast, an agent of his, and together, first and second beast work for none other than the devil. First beast, remember, was this composite of the beasts of Daniel 7, a political entity having seven heads and ten horns. And ten horns in the Bible depicts power, often political power, and so it is, as Daniel himself is given to interpret. John here sees a beast having seven heads and ten horns. And the beast has a leopard-like appearance. His feet are like a bear. His mouth is like the mouth of a lion. Similar to the, the four different beasts who are described for us in Daniel 7. Whereby we're given to know that this beast of, of Revelation 13 in the first part is a composite or culmination of all the kingdoms that have yet to come, this one is all the power that they envied and they sought after in one. It's all that the kingdoms of those uh, in the Old Testament and also coming up to the New Testament stood for in the service even of the devil. Because indeed, this kingdom in, in the, the first part of Revelation 13 is a kingdom that has blasphemy on its heads. It is in the service of the devon, devil because the dragon, verse 2, gives this beast his power, his throne, and his great authority. And so people who bow to this uh, political entity worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying who's like the beast, who's able to make war with him, and so on. Now... The second beast seems to be, at the first glance, very different than the first beast just because of his appearance. This other beast isn't looking lion-like or leopard-like, doesn't have the feet of a bear, 
His mouth is not like the mouth of a lion. Rather, he comes out of the earth and he has two horns like a lamb. Seems to be a rather tame beast. But then we hear in the next phrase that he speaks like a dragon. And there's the connection between this beast, the second beast who comes out of the earth, and the first beast who comes out of the sea. And the connection is the dragon. In fact, we find here in this second beast that he's speaking for the dragon and also in service of the first beast. Note the link in verse 12. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. He's always together with the first beast, con cons cohorting with him and consorting with him. And he causes the earth as well and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And everything about this second beast and all he does bespeaks of his connection with the first beast and their connection, first and second, a political entity and a, and a religious sort of entity with the dragon. The dragon is their king. The dragon is the one they represent. And I believe this tells us that the second beast is like unto the first, even a part and a picture, an aspect of what is called the Antichrist. In fact, this second beast is the first beast's and the devil's minister of propaganda. That's what I would call him following someone who has described this appropriately, I believe. He's a minister of propaganda for the devil and for this political entity. He's one who would, not by sword, not by force and brute force, but by persuasion, win not only over the, the allegiance outwardly of people, but win the hearts of people and indeed enlist them into the service of the devil in a very subtle way by convincing them that to serve the first beast and the devil he represents is a good thing, is something they should do wholeheartedly and gladly, and it's all in the service, as we shall see, of mankind. He is, this, this second beast, I believe, as the minister of propaganda for the political entity, with all the horns and the powers and the sword power of a political entity, he is, I submit to you, the very same as the false prophet that is mentioned later on in the book of Revelation. You might want to turn with me to these references and you'll see the connection that I would make between this second beast and what's called the false prophet. And I have the references in your outline, Revelation 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, uh, and that's the devil again, out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. There's that great unholy trinity, dragon, first beast, and second beast, the, the first political entity and this second beast who's likened to the false prophet. 19 verse 20 links even more closely the second beast of Revelation 13 with the false prophet. Revelation 19 verse 20 says this, then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet. There they go again, those cronies. First and second beast, the false prophet who works signs in his presence, just like Revelation 13, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and so on. But then you turn to Revelation 20, and verse 10. The devil who deceived them <clears throat> was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so I believe it's beyond debate that the identity of this second beast out of the earth is the false prophet. He's the false prophet, the minister of propaganda, spreading the lies about, about God and Christ and everything in the service of the first beast, this political entity 
who is, as we shall see, the one who holds the, the purse strings and who has such control at the end of time that he will control what you buy, what you sell, and who buys and who sells. So you have him, the false prophet, here. And you even see that this one is acting like a prophet, exercising all the authority of the first beast, but by speaking. He deceives those, in verse 14, who dwell on the earth by signs and so on. And then he tells them, verse 15, who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast and so on. He speaks to them. And he tells them in a certain way, you can imagine, so that they themselves are involved in making of an idol of the beast and worshiping the beast. They come on board this cause. The hearts have been won. The minds have been, quote unquote, enlightened by the message of this false beast, even though all along they're believing the lie. Because that, of course, is the message of this false prophet in the service of the dragon and the first beast, the lie. Even as the devil is a liar from the beginning and the great deceiver, so the Antichrist in this aspect that he has as a false prophet rising out of the earth is a liar. And everything about him, really, even his appearance, he has two horns as of a lamb, bespeaks his deception and his subtlety and his trickery. He comes even appearing to have the message of Jesus. He's one who appears in the name of Jesus, even though he is in the service of the first beast and of the dragon. He has this subtle way about him to convince people that he's the Christ even. And even as the Apostle Paul reminds us in Second Thessalonians 2, He's one who enthrones himself in the temple and even convinces people that he's God and that the first beast is as God and that therefore he should be worshipped. This is the, the role of this second beast or that aspect of the Antichrist, this religious and spiritual message and delusion that he spreads among the sons of men. So... Very, very powerful, his message. And again, as a prophet, he's speaking for someone else. But as a false prophet, according to Revelation 19 and 20, he's speaking the lie, the lie, even in the garb of truth. He says, Jesus reminds us, Matthew 7, verse 15, that many would come and they would speak the lie, wolves in sheep's clothing. Paul in Corinthians speaks of Wolves and devils who are, who are disguised as angels of light, and they weasel their way into the church of Christ even. Well, this Antichrist as a false prophet, or with his false prophet, his ally, the false church, he has his way of persuading people in the church, persuading them that this health care system or that health care system or this power is the power to yield to. And this image is the image to build. And this cause, even the cause of world peace and the cause of health and wealth and the goodness of men is worth pursuing because, he will say, it's Christ's cause. And you're Christian, aren't you? You should do this, shouldn't you? It's true, isn't it? We're called to love, aren't we? In so many ways he has of duping God's people even, if it were possible, with this lie. Jesus himself spoke of this angel of light, this false prophet who would come, Matthew 24 and verse 20 and following. For then there shall be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be, unless those days were shortened. No flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it. Note, for false Christs, false prophets, 
will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect of God. People of God, this leads us to this next characteristic of the, the false prophet, this beast who rises out of the earth. He is one who works miracles. Revelation 13 describes this beast who has the authority of the first beast and so on to perform, he, that he performs great signs, verse 13, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now, this is, this is amazing. I believe we should think that these miracles indeed that are given to the false prophet to perform are true miracles. Now, they're not miracles in that they're of God, but I believe that God gives certain powers even to devils and as judgments to work miracles in the earth. It's part of the great delusion of Satan, but it is part of the judgment of God. And the miracles are those miracles that authenticate the message of this minister of propaganda. He comes, you see, with a message, and he says, it must be true because of the wonders that he does, even calling fire down from heaven. Reminds you of Elijah, doesn't it? He authenticated his message by having fire come down from heaven as if um, because God approved of it. Well, this is what this false prophet's doing. He's calling down fire from heaven to dupe the people into thinking that God Almighty approves of him. This is why. This is why it's so deceptive even among the churchgoers. This is why, if not for the fact that God would shorten the days, whatever that means, the very elect themselves would be deceived. So he works his miracles. And the principle of which is he calls his fire to come down from heaven in the sight of men. And then he deceives those on the earth to make an image of the first beast and causes the image to speak even. He's like this Frankenstein who makes this monster, this image of this first beast to be alive. And so people, they're so persuaded of the creative powers of this beast, this one who comes as a lamb but speaks as a dragon with forked tongue, of course, that they worship this idol. And then, of course, he causes many to receive a mark to show their allegiance to the first beast, and all who do not bear this mark and worship the image of the beast shall be killed. Now, what the Bible is speaking of here people of God, and what Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24 is this. This is going to be an awesome time for those who remain on the earth who are faithful to God. There is this kingdom that rises, and the whole world is taken up and enamored with the power of this kingdom, but also persuaded in their minds and in their hearts of the, the truth and divinity of this kingdom and king. That they worship the beast. And so persuasive are they. That they, they hold the purse strings. And they hold the economy in their power. As well as the hearts of men. And they would persuade by hook and by crook. And by pocket book. The people of God themselves. To bow down. And to worship. Are we ready? Are we ready for this? Do we see anything coming down the pike that reminds us of this false prophet? The first beast, the aspect of the Antichrist, is a political entity gathering into one all kinds of people who are disparate and disjointed and disconnected until that, that political entity arose. Do we see the second beast rising out of the earth, a religious force and power? Do we see one who is so persuasive and so convincing and so pulling all the churches together to be together to be believing him? Do we behold miracles? Are there anyone, 
Is there anyone who's drawing fire down from heaven or working maybe technological miracles to cause us to wonder and even to believe that it's true that Jesus and his kingdom are coming and have come? Now, John is given to see that this second beast causes all, both uh, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. And he says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, his number is 666. And I want to focus on that for a little bit here. But in the first place, I want to say this is probably the most disputed passage of Revelation, this number of the beast, what it is to wear the mark of the beast, the mark of the number or the name of the beast. They're all synonymous here. And there's been no sort of speculation, no, no limit to the speculation that's gone on with regard to attempts to figure out this name or this number. And this name or this number that's, that's crucial in the identification of this beast, this anti-Christian power. Well, many have, by arithmetic and by sheer wit, sought to discern the identity of this man who's apparently identified by the number 666. I think we've spoken somewhat of this, and we mentioned this in our Kuiper Grace Life Conversations this past week, and I want to just bring this up before you at this time. There's a, uh, a way of trying to discern <clears throat> names by different numbers, letters that correspond to numbers and nar numbers that correspond to, to names or, or to, to uh, letters. And it used to be something that they did in those days, even sometimes to hide their real intention when they would say, well, here's number 455, referring to some person. And how it went is that among the, the Greeks, maybe, there would be the first 10 letters of the Greek alphabet, each would stand for a number. And the next 10 would stand for other numbers. And you're all familiar, at least most of us of the old school, with how Roman numerals in the Latin tongue would stand for numbers. There would be the number or the letter X, uh, they would stand for letters. The, the letter X would be 10, and the letter L would be 50. Well, what people have tried to do is to say, well, 666 stands for what, maybe X or maybe L, and they come up with certain names. And then they say, well, see, that person, like Nero, and they were always seeking to find the Antichrist in the identity of the Roman emperors. Say so that number, those numbers 666, they stand for Nero. If you just do the math and you come up with some additional pro, uh, mathematic uh, equations here, you come up with 666 and Nero wasn't he an enemy of the church? And didn't he enlist the religious authorities as well in his propaganda to persuade the minds of the Romans that the Christians were the problem? Wasn't it Nero? Or maybe it was Caligula, or Domitian, or Vespasian, others of the Roman emperors. And on and on people have gone in their seeking by this arithmetic and this, and this correspondence of, of letters and numbers to find persons who matched and whose character surely was anti-Christian, they would say. Well, people have found antichrist in the Pope. And every Pope and certain Popes they would find this was the antichrist. The number of a man, 666, well, that, that corresponds with Pope John II and so on. Some have said it was Oliver Cromwell, others Martin Luther, Others, of course, would, would find Adolf Hitler. He's the Antichrist, and so on. Others, Henry Kissinger, John F. Kennedy, Mikhail Gorbachev. All of these people have been identified by some uh, 
arithmetic or some uh, correspondence that they know between history and the Bible uh, with the Antichrist. Well, I believe, people of God, that we're never going to get anywhere with all this arithmetic trying to discern the significance of the number 666. And the Bible itself reminds us that it takes wisdom to discern the identity of the number. Note verse 18. Here is wisdom. And it takes understanding. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. I want to submit to you another translation. Which is perfectly acceptable from the Greek translation. Or the Greek uh, original. I believe that this translation is better, the last part of verse 18. The number of the beast is the number of man. His number is 666. Do you see what I left out of the New King James translation? Not the number of a man, any in particular man, but the number of man. There's no indefinite article there. The Greek doesn't have such. It's the number of man. It's the number of what man stands for, in other words. That's what I submit to you is what's being taught here. In other words, the number of the beast, 666, is everything that human beings live for and die for, but human beings without God. Human beings in the service of the dragon since the fall of man into sin and the dupe of which men have been persuaded for history long that we shall be as gods. 666 itself is symbolic, I believe, according to the numerology of the Bible, of man. Six days God created all things on the sixth day man. 666 is a multiple of that, even in spades, sim symbolizing, I believe, man in all of his completeness and culmination and powers, political, philosophical, and moral, and spiritual, and religious, without God, and without the rest of God, without the Trinity. You see here... This number 666 is really an appropriate name for the book of Ecclesiastes. All is vanity. That's the point of Ecclesiastic, uh, Ecclesiastes, the book of wisdom in the Old Testament. All is vanity without God. All is a vapor. All is empty. All of the accomplishments of men are as nothing. All of the enlightenment of men is darkness. And all of the success of men is but a triumph and a feather in a hat to a man who deserves nothing but the wrath of God. And I believe, therefore, that <clears throat> bearing the number of the beast or his name is simply describing those who bear the character of all that the beast and the Antichrist stand for, man and his kingdom without God. Now, I don't know if there's going to be a specific way that the ungodly will be identified in the end of time. Some have alluded or thought that there's going to be a microchip that's going to be put in the foreheads or on the hands of people. But I do know this. The character of those who worship the beast will be known clearly by what they think, forehead, and by what, by what they do, their hand. The symbolism of the 666 goes deep, not superficially, but goes deep into the heart of things here. What John is describing is a people who have come over to the side of the devil. 
They have come over and shown by their character, by their activity, by their thinking outside of the Word of God, and by their changing the truth into a lie, that they are of the devil. And all that they do and think in all of their activities, which will also be against the church, bespeak this, that they are marked out as Satan's seed. And they bear the mark of the beast because they have the character of the beast. And however that's going to surface itself in some other way, easily identifiable, it certainly will surface in this, the character of the people. The fruits of the false prophets will show themselves in churches and in children and in young people and in universities and in colleges that call themselves Christians as evil. That's wisdom. That's indeed what will be the case. In fact, I believe that this anti-Christian beast, this false prophet, especially at the end of time, will represent with the political aspect of that kingdom everything that man has always sought. Everything. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, Man's way. A name unto man in his accomplishments as the pinnacle of evolution. And a name unto man's science and all that he can discover. In all that the National Geographic tells us he discovers and they discover and their think tanks think in these latter days. I believe that the anti-Christian prophet and the political power will be the culmination of Babel. When the people of the world sought to make a name for themselves instead of in obedience to God spreading out and showing forth the praises of God in their occupations and they sought to make a name for themselves and God scattered the crowd. I believe at this time, at the end of time, the crowd will be brought together. The devil's let loose. His deadly wound is healed. And everyone is seeing we need to be together against God. We need to be together to squash out this religion called Christianity, true Christianity, which is intolerant and which is not the theology of this Jesus that we know. That's what's happening today, people of God. The anti-Christian spirit, the false prophet, is having his way. What are we going to do? What are our children and young people going to do? What are we called to do here? John is writing to the churches here. God wants us to hear this message. Well, certainly, we're to have wisdom. Here is wisdom. That's what John is saying. And he's saying, of course, that's a good thing. And early on in the other chapter, he said, here's the patience and the faith of the saints. And if anyone has an ear, let him hear. That's what the first calling is. We must be wise. We must be believing. We must be those who have the wisdom that is from above and not from the earth. Striking, James in chapter 3 speaks of the wisdom from above but the wisdom from the earth, which is sensual and devilish. Have nothing of the earth, no wisdom of the earth. And I dare say that our believing will show its fruit, the fruit, people of God, in our simply being so otherworldly that we're not taken up in the anti-Christian successes, the anti-Christian worship that passes off for gospel. We're going to be so taken up into Jesus and into thinking about the, the, the treasure that money cannot buy, that it won't matter to us even if they tell us, well, you can't worship. You can't, you can't buy, you know, I should say, that you can't buy, you can't sell unless you come with us on the Lord's Day to do our thing and not your thing and worship. It won't matter to us. We simply will go hungry. It won't be easy. We'll simply 
find some other way or we'll go hungry and even perish if that's our lot in this life. We're going to be so taken up into Jesus and fellowship with him, and we must be. In fact, there's a tie here between our sermon this morning and the sermon tonight. What do we say about the unity of the church this morning? It's a unity wherein Christ is all in all. And I want to present to you and exhort you with regard to this fact here, beloved, that this is all important when we consider the Antichrist and the temptation there will be, that there will be even among the church members to worship the beast. The solution is, the answer is, the wisdom is, may Christ be all in all in your life, all in all, all in everything that you live for, everything that you would die for, all of your worship, all of your buying and selling, all of your investments, everything you do, all your relationships, may Christ be all in all. May he be all in all in your leisure, in what you watch in the television, in your surfing the internet, in the courses you take at school, in the plans you have, May Jesus be all in all in the church, in the preaching, and in what you desire from this pulpit. Do you desire Jesus? Do you want to see Jesus in the pulpit and hear him in the pulpit? Praise the Lord, because that's what Jesus wants from pulpits. The gospel, the good news, the truth of forgiveness, the truth of true peace with God, the truth of the sole allegiance that God requires, the truth that's for living and for bearing the marks and character of true children of God. You see, that's the difference between us and the anti-Christian worshipers. We would bear the marks of Christians, which are stripes, which are lashes, which are crosses we bear and which are the fruit of the Holy Spirit, fruits that no one wants to bear because they don't get you ahead, like love and joy and peace and long-suffering and patience and kindness and love for your enemies and being like the Lamb. Well, people of God, do we have that? You see, it's all about focusing on Jesus. I believe that many, in their desperate attempts to find the identity of the Antichrist by their arithmetic and their puzzles and so on and their wit in 666 have missed the point. Wisdom is discerning the Antichrist by being in love with the Christ. You know what they say in the bank, banking industry, here's how you tell a counterfeit, not by looking at all the counterfeits, but by knowing the reality. Here's how we know a counterfeit the false Christ, the Antichrist, know Jesus now. Don't put it off. Believe on him. Show forth the fruits of your believing on him, of repentance and of faith, that you are living not for this world, but for this other place, this home that we share in heaven. Show by your showing off Jesus and wanting to live unto him, that you're not going to be duped and show also finally by this your confidence in God that you are his. And that is a key note here. You see, the, the devil has all of these marks whereby he seals his own. But we need to be reminded that God has marked out his own. He sealed us, the complete number of his church, the 144,000. He's not only marked us, but he sealed us. We are his, beloved. We are his, and we are his for Jesus' sake. And Jesus has always been on the mind of the Father, so that from the foundation of the world he's slain for the sins of his people. And Jesus is the one by whom and for whom everything was made, that he might have the preeminence. And because Jesus is on the mind of the Father, so are we. So are we ever mindful of us who will help us and even shorten the days if we live in those final days of the Antichrist so that we will not be deceived. 
We will be those who have wisdom and grace to carry on. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. and Be wise and be faithful unto death. Let no one take your crown. Praise be to God and his Christ in these dark days. Let the light shine. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless us, that the word may now not drop to the ground, but go into our hearts. Speak, Lord. Speak, we pray. May the echoes of what we've heard Jesus himself preach as the good shepherd from heaven, the true Lamb of God, find their way and become our song. Hear our prayers. Receive our songs of delight, our praises, all praise to you, Lord. Reveal to us in the Lamb who is the great Lion of the tribe of Judah, who is sovereign and who is coming, and whose coming we anticipate and celebrate. Amen. <clears throat> Four hundred eighty four song of triumph in the king who is going to lead us through even to the end. Three stanzas, four hundred eighty four. Receive God's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.
Thank you for tuning in to this broadcast of Sovereign Grace United Reformed Church. Sovereign Grace Church, served by the ministry of Reverend Mitchell Dick, worships each Lord's Day at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. at the chapel of Kuiper College, located at 3333 East Beltline Northeast, between Three Mile and Four Mile Roads. You are most cordially welcome to join us for worship or visit us online at www.sgurc.org or contact us by phone at 616-406-8562. It is our prayer that the Lord would add his indispensable blessing to this ministry in order that his name would be glorified through the edification of his people and the translation of sinners out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear Son.